So, um, where and when were you born? I was born in um, Manchester, England, in 1967. And what month? I'm interested in people's astrological... Oh, April, April the 30th, so, 1967. So is that Taurus? Taurus, yeah, I'm Taurus. Uh-huh. Um, and do you, do you feel Taurian? Does, are you earthy and like beauty and is that kind of thing? <laughs> yeah, I am quite stubborn. I've heard that that's a characteristic of Taurians. Um, but I'm also, I've, I've read that Tor Taurians can be um, quite interested in material things and they're quite practical and kind of earthbound. I'm not like that at all. I'm, I'm not materialistic at all. I'm, you know, I'm not particularly practical. I'm not interested in comforts. And that. I, I, so I don't know. Um, um, I guess in some ways I do fit, in other ways maybe not. Right, and that's true because we have 12 houses and lots of planets and relationships, so it's a complex system. Mm, mm. Um, as a psychologist, do you know your, your Myers-Briggs, your personality type? Uh, I don't know. I know that I'm an introvert, um, but that's all I know. I'll send you a link because my hypothesis is that Visionary scientists will be intuitive rather than sensing on the Myers-Briggs, and so far that's true for everybody but one person. Right, yeah, yeah. And I'm quite creative. I, I write poetry, used to write fiction, so I guess, you know, I'm probably class as intuitive as well. Well, we'll see. I'll send you the link, and it won't take long if that's, that's fine. Um, do you... Do you find traveling around that um, if you're giving a presentation or talk that it will be a slightly different approach that you use in England or the U.S. or on the continent? Uh, are there kind of uh, national characters? Is that stretching it too far? Uh, no, well, I, I found that... Um I've only done a few talks in the U.S., maybe five or six. Uh, I've done talks in Brazil, also in Europe. And I found that um, American audiences tend to be a bit more, a bit lighter, that they tend to be a bit more humorous. Um, so I, I tend to be, I think maybe in, in reflection of that, I tend to be a bit kind of uh, more lively and humorous when I do talks in the U.S., Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I think, but, you know, th there's a trait, which I think is true, that kind of the natural trait of um, English people is slightly reserved, and that comes over in audiences. Audiences are slightly reserved as well, I think. And I think of Brits as having a dry sense of humor. I mean, they're, they're, yeah. they have a, a great sense of humor, but it's just drier. That's right, yeah. It's quite ironic. The humor, a little bit sarcastic. Yeah. Uh, it's quite it can be quite subtle, but yeah, that's definitely a difference. I, I used to live in Germany. I lived in Germany for four years, and um, you know, I was very aware of the you know, not not major differences, but slight subtle differences in the national characters. You know, um, particularly in humor. Like if I was ironic to my German friends, they just wouldn't get it. <laughs> they they always thought I was being serious. So it was quite uh, it was kind of dangerous sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, were you in graduate school in Germany? No, no, I, I was a musician and um, oh, wow. my band, this is when I was like in my early 20s, I was a musician and my band did a tour of Germany. Uh, so I, I met a girl, kind of fell in love and stayed in Germany for four years because of that. Mm -hmm. And I carried on being a musician in Germany. And did you carry on with that same girl? No, unfortunately, yeah, we broke up after four years. That's why I came back to England after four years. Uh huh. Uh, I understand. Um, and then, and then, what what led you to go to graduate school and become a psychologist? Well, it was because I learned about a field of psychology. I mean, I'd always been interested in psychology and and philosophy and science in general. Uh, but but I'd always been put off by the the kind of materialistic um, assumptions of science, you know, the, the, the kind of skepticism towards 
psychic phenomena like telepathy and precognition, uh, the skepticism towards um, higher states of consciousness, and just the the general um, the general assumptions that you know the ordinary perception of the world is the correct one, and anything that deviates from that is some somehow aberrational. Um, so I, I never really saw myself as becoming a scientist or a psychologist because of that. But then I discovered a field of psychology called transpersonal psychology. And it was through reading uh, a book by Ken Wilber. And that was the first time I heard the term transpersonal psychology. So as soon as I, as soon as I, heard, I saw that term and read about it and understood what transpersonal psychology was, I thought, yeah, this is me. This is where I want to be. This is what I want to do. I realized that, I realized that it was possible to study spiritual experiences, uh, transformational experiences in a scientific way from a psychological perspective. And that was what I wanted to do. So transpersonal, define that for us. Well, li literally, transpersonal means beyond the self, you know, transpersonal or beyond the ego, you could say. So it's a study of um, states of consciousness beyond the ego. It's the study of um, higher states of consciousness, the study of spiritual experiences. And it's really, I, I often think of it as the, um, it's where Eastern philosophy meets Western psychology. And it's the, it kind of explores the common ground between psychology and Eastern philosophy and investigates spirituality and spiritual traditions and practices and paths from a psychological point of view. You know, it's, it's so ironic, speaking of irony, that it seems that psychiatry and psychologists have moved even closer to pharmaceuticals and you have a problem, you're anxious or depressed, we're going to give you a pill and we're not going to delve too much into your deep psychological issues. It's, it's like it's moved, the field has moved away from transpersonal approach. Do you agree with that or not? Uh, I think it did. It did move away in the 1990s and the 2000s. But my feeling is, particularly here in the UK, is that it's moving back. Uh, I think there's kind of like a, a rear guard action away from a kind of pharmacological and neuroscientific perspective. Um, I think more and more psychiatrists and psychologists are interested in what you could call the Eastern perspectives, like mindfulness and more holistic perspectives on mental health. So things like ecotherapy, you know, that's that's there's definitely some interest in that here in the UK. Uh, some some health trusts will recommend courses of gardening, as, you know, for depressed people. Wow. <laughs> Encounters with um, dolphins. Uh, dolphins. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, sort of wild sports, like, um, you know, um, therapeutic. It's, you know, sort of encounters with nature as, as, a, as a therapeutic uh, tool. That's becoming more popular. Um, so, and, and yeah, there's so much interest in mindfulness. So, and even I saw a video last week of uh, the British Prime Minister, Theresa May, discussing mindfulness in the House of Parliament. <laughs> and, but yeah, and there's, uh, there's, there's programs to... The government are piloting programs uh, in mindfulness in schools, you know. Um, so it could be that next year it's going to be it's going to be part of the school curriculum in the UK, mindfulness for every wow. child. So, so I think yeah, there are some healthy signs at the moment. In in the US, it seems like the insurance industry propels doctors of all kind to to go quickly. You know, you have fifteen mm -hmm. minutes. With, with the patient, so you're not going to get into their core issues in, in yeah, such a short Yeah, that's the same time. here as well, yeah. Hmm. That's the same here, but I think people are realizing it doesn't work. I think there's more awareness that um, antidepressants, you know, if they work at all, it's only as a sort of a quick fix. That There has to be some more holistic, more deep-rooted kind of therapy. That's encouraging. I don't. I don't think that's mainstream here. But mindfulness is, and I. I think that's kind of a clever way of not saying meditation and offending fundamentalist Christians, and then. Yeah. <laughs> well, not offend scientists as well. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so somehow, mindfulness is okay, 
partly because of Harvard studies, John Kabat-Zinn, that show that it, it is efficacious. But um, they, but they don't want to use the word meditation, I don't think. No, I think they, they, they've been quite clever. People like John Kabat-Zinn, I think in the UK, it's a guy called Mark Williams. They do it very cleverly because they've taken it out of the, the Eastern, the Buddhist context, and they've kind of marketed it for, for the West. Yeah. And some, some Buddhists don't like it because it, it is, a, they call it Mac mindfulness or Mac meditation, you know, kind of McDonald's version of uh, meditation. But, um, but uh, yeah, no, it's, it's difficult. It has, it, you know, it has become part of the mainstream, so it's, overall it's pretty encouraging. Yes, that's, that's true. So mm -hmm. did, before you went to Germany, did you finish your undergraduate university? I did, but I studied literature originally because I, you know, I was always interested in poetry and uh, I wrote poetry. Um, so that was my initial degree. Mm -hmm. And then when you discovered this transpersonal psychology, you went, back, you went to graduate school? Yeah, I went back to do a master's degree in MSc in consciousness studies. Hmm. And then I did a PhD in transpersonal psychology after that. And what university offered an, an, an MS in, in consciousness studies? Uh, it, was, it was a place called Liverpool John Moores University in, in Liverpool. Um, and then you've developed a, a master's program like that at, at your university? Yeah, at Leeds Beckett University. We have a, a master's degree in interdisciplinary psychology. That's what we call it. But... Um, Around half of the content, if not more, is, uh, you could call it spiritual psychology or transpersonal psychology. And did you develop that, or is that already there before you started teaching? No, we, we developed it. With my colleagues, we, we've developed it. And is, are there other universities that, operate, uh, that offer that kind of a course? Uh, there's a few. There's... Um, um, well, Liverpool John Moores University, which I've just mentioned, they do an online master's, master's degree. Uh, I think that is called Consciousness, Spirituality, and Transpersonal Psychology, so it's very similar to ours. Um, there's also the University of Northampton. Uh, they, they do an, MS, an MSc in Transpersonal Psychology, although I think it's, gonna, it's closing in the next year or two. Hmm. But um, I think those are the only two of the places at the mm -hmm. moment. Uh, okay. My understanding is that that um, Edinburgh got an endowed chair to study parapsychology, and then they created something like fifty graduate students that spread around the UK to teach. Is is that a, a historical accuracy? Um, I'm not sure. To be honest, I know that the University of Edinburgh they 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 published quite a few papers. They published a lot of research on uh, parapsychology, but I don't, know what, I don't know what the current situation is. Where is Chris Rowe? His name comes up, R-O-E. Yeah, he's, um, he was the chair of the Transpersonal Psychology uh, section of the, of the British Psychological Society. In, in the UK, Transpersonal Psychology is um, one of the sections of the BPS, the British Psychological Society. So Chris was the previous chair. I'm, I'm the new chair of the society. He was the previous chair. So I know him quite well. He's at the University of Northampton. Mm -hmm. he, does, he does a lot of research on Psy. Right. Um, let, let's go back to your childhood. What What was your um, the the kind of bi biographical context that led you to be such an achiever? I mean, you're you're a poet. You're a musician. You're a professor. You're a prolific writer, bestseller. What What do you attribute that all to? Well, I, probably to reincarnation, actually, <laughs> because um, there was nothing really in my environment which, po which pointed me in that direction. My environment, my upbringing was very ordinary, in inverted commas, you know, kind of working class. It was all about kind of football, soccer, we, you, you call it. Um, you know, my, my, my father was obsessed with football, um, a sport in general, and... It was about, you know, in, Britain, in England we go to pubs as well, it was about drinking beer. That was the kind of the environment I was brought, brought up in. So there was, no, there was no culture, no books or music or theatre or anything like that. It was very, you know, very basic. Um, so, but I don't, so I don't know where it came from, but when I was about 
15 or 16 years old, I, I changed quite significantly, became very introverted, and started to read, um, and started to write as well. You know, I realized I wanted to be a writer of some form, so I started, started to write poetry, uh, to write essays and stories. And so, yeah, and then, then I began to have what, what I now would call spiritual experiences or awakening experiences, so moments of um, ecstatic oneness with my surroundings, uh, feelings of euphoria, moments in which the world would become incredibly real and uh, life seemed to make sense, you know, the world seemed to make sense. And so, yeah, I began to have those experiences. But because it was so different to my upbringing, I wasn't sure what to make of it. I thought maybe there was something wrong with me. I thought I was crazy. crazy. Yeah. So, uh, so it took a few years before I sort of began to understand myself and began to make sense of the experiences I've been having. Did, did you have a teacher that encouraged you? Because usually children who excel in, I would say, difficult environments usually have a mentor of some kind who believes in them. No, not really. No. Oh, interesting. Um, I didn't really meet anybody who who was interested in things I was interested in, like spirituality, um, poetry, philosophy. Um, probably. Well, I, I I had a good friend who sort of. I guess he was, he was the same age as me, but he was one year older than me, a friend of mine called Joe. And we, when we were like 19 or 20 years old, we started to read a lot of the same books. And, and we realized that we were interested in philosophy and spirituality. So, yeah, I was quite close to my friend Joe. And he was always, I always thought of, thought of him as my guru in a way, because he was a very, he was a very stable, very calm person, very quiet person, but very, very at ease with himself. Centered, I would say. Very centered, yeah. He never cared about what other people thought of him, and mm. you know, it was the kind of person he could. He just he could sometimes um, he sometimes remain silent in a group of people for two hours without saying a word, but he wouldn't disturb him. He'd just be completely calm, and you know, he felt no impulse to just talk for the sake of it, and or to pretend to be anything else than he was. So, yeah, I think I gained a lot from my friend Joe. And I, I can see you as a. Um past life as a contemplative kind of scholarly monk in a some kind of hilltop somewhere studying and thinking so I I, I think you're probably right you probably came in with that kind of reflective bent I think so yeah because there was really nothing that you know the, the kind of person I am now or the kind of person I became when I was 16, 17 years old, there was really nothing, there was really no influence from my environment. It was something that was, was strangely independent of my environment, of my parents and my brother. Um, so yeah, I guess one way of interpreting it would be some kind of reincarnation. Mm -hmm. um, when you had those kind of ecstatic experiences, was there any triggers? Were you taking psychedelic drugs? What, 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 mm -hmm. what, would, what would trigger them? Um, well, only nature. They'd always happen when I was um, walking in a park or walking through my, the school fields, the fields at my school. Sometimes just walking down the street at night, looking at the sky. But, um, yeah, it was, it was usually connected to nature. Mm -hmm. uh, I also think that maybe it was connected to, I mean, one of the things I found out in my research and the research I've done into transformational experiences, I found that they often come in the midst of psychological turmoil, yeah. you know, states of depression and stress and, and so forth, bereavement or addiction and so on. So I wondered if, you know, because I was, I was pretty unhappy at the age of 16, 17, I was quite depressed and frustrated, you know, I felt like a misfit, I didn't understand myself at all. So maybe that kind of turmoil was part of it as well. I'm not sure. Maybe that was a factor, but certainly nature was a big factor. Um, mystics typically have a, a, the dark night of the soul that they go mm. through before they have those kind of enlightenment experiences. So it's, it seems to be a pattern. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think um, 
there's a kind of um, yeah, there's such a close relationship between cl close relationship between suffering and spiritual experience that they're, they're so closely interlinked, and I think that's the concept of the dark night of the soul is a is an expression of that. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's possible to to achieve a really deep state of uh, enlightenment without a period of intense suffering. The suffering seems to sort of deepen us and open us up inside. It seems to create a space within us which, you know, in, within which a fuller experience of enlightenment can manifest itself. There, there, do you remember the that little book by Gabriel Garan, the prophet? And he, yeah. he he says that you need to carve out a uh, uh, from suffering carves out a deeper hole for joy and 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 that mm. and bliss. So, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very true. Yeah, I think I think that's very very true. Um, and physiologically, people like Bernardo Castrop are saying that those kind of experiences, difficult ones, or drugs, or uh, some kind of deprivation uh, reduces the filter of the brain and so it allows the transcendent mind to come in because the brain isn't so much in control it the filter in it is less mm. yeah I'm a little bit dubious about that about the, the about this idea of the you know filter theory I'm a little bit dubious about it I don't see why uh, an incredibly complex mechanism like the brain should have developed you know, as a way of screening out transcendent experience. Um, and also, it sort of suggests that, you know, that beings with less complex brains than ours will be living in a, a, a state of transcendent experience, you know, like insects and animals. I mean, maybe they are. We don't know. But, but um, I don't know. It seems a bit strange to me. I mean, I, I think of it in psychological terms is that when you, when you go for intense suffering, it breaks down your normal self. You know, I, I think of the the, the ego, ego, the, the ego, normal the ego, as a kind of collection of building blocks of attachments. You know, attachments to the future, attachments to the past, attachments to possessions, to status, to ambitions, to beliefs, and so on. So when you go through intense suffering, these uh, these building blocks are taken away. You know, your hopes are taken away, your possessions are taken away, your status is taken away, and so on. So the ego itself collapses, just the way the way that a house collapses when the bricks are taken away. Um, when the ego collapses, sometimes that can be a state of psychosis, you know, a real breakdown. But in some people, there seems to be a kind of latent higher self, which is ready, which is waiting for the opportunity to emerge. So when the normal ego breaks down, sometimes in some people, that latent higher self emerges and becomes their normal state. A bit like, a, you know, a, a butterfly emerging from a chrysalis. So it's not the filter of the brain, it's a filter of the ego that yeah. changes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I'm not a big advocate of uh, filter theory, no. <laughs> but you are a filter theory in terms of ego. In terms of ego, yeah, but not in terms of the brain. Yeah. I don't, I don't see why a, you know, a collection of 100 billion cells working together in incredibly complex ways, I don't see why the purpose of that structure should be to shield us from transcendent reality. Except well, uh, that if, if you were so open to consciousness with a big C, you might just sit in bliss and not go chop wood, carry water, you know? Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't think that actually happens. I think most people who become open to transcendent consciousness actually, I mean, some people do become incapable of functioning in the world, but, you know, in my research, I'm, you know, I've... I've studied many cases of people who achieve a high state of consciousness as their normal state, who wake up permanently, usually through intense suffering. And yeah, they don't they don't usually become incapable of, of functioning. They become practical. You know, they st they're still practical. They're still able to wash the dishes and drive cars. But whenever they they don't need to be focused on practical things, they can tune back into the the state of oneness. It's always there in the background even if it's the, not in the foreground. You know, they, they still have the ability to focus in and out of practical tasks. Um, some people arrive at that not through um, hardship, but through 
spiritual practices like meditation or, you know, sitting in silence at a retreat or, mm. as you say, being in nature. So um, I don't know if we can put a percentage on it, but the, of the people that you studied, uh, roughly what percent got there, not because of hardship, but because of spiritual practice? Well, I um, in my book, The Leap, I say that there are three ways in which people can attain wakefulness. And the first way is when it's just natural to them, when they, they're just born like that. Or maybe, you know, I think young children are awake to some degree. They definitely have qualities of spiritual awakening. Even if you, could, you couldn't say that they're enlightened, but they certainly have qualities of spiritual awakening. But most of us lose that as we become adults. So maybe some people never lose it, they just retain it, and maybe it becomes more intense and becomes more integrated. And those people often become poets, like Walt Whitman. Um, he's like the archetypal sort of awakened poet. Uh, even Mary Oliver, who's recently deceased, she died a few couple of weeks ago. You know, if you read her poetry, she's definitely had some degree of um, heightened awareness. So those people often become poets or maybe artists, painters, Sometimes social activists, because they have such a strong sense of compassion, um, altruism. Um, but the second way is when, like you say, when it happens through spiritual practice. It happens gradually through following a spiritual path like Buddhism or the Kabbalah or Taoism. And, yeah, I think, you know, there are, there are billions of people, maybe not billions, hundreds of millions of people around the world following these paths and practices. So everybody... You can't, you know, you, you can't meditate for 10 years without undergoing some gradual <laughs> spiritual awakening. Even if it's, you know, to a small degree, there, there are lots of different degrees of awakening. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, in my, I've, in my research, I've tended to focus on people who have these dramatic sudden awakenings. That's been the topic of a lot of my research. But obviously, you know, I think probably the majority of people who attain awakening do so through those gradual paths. Mm -hmm. um, and do you have a meditation practice personally? Yeah, well, I had a, I had a few. I, I learned uh, TM when I was 19, Transcendental Meditation, and I occasionally go back to that. Um, but I, I also learned, um, I studied a, a tantric yoga practice for, for a couple of years. So I, I started meditation from that, which I use. And... I did have a, a spiritual teacher who, who also taught me a, um, a technique as well. So I kind of interchange between two or three different techniques, depending mm -hmm. on my mood or the situation. Um, with, with three children and work and writing and, you know, just being a human, how much of the time are you able to stay in, a, in that awakened state, personally? <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, well, it's a bit like I said before, you know, it's difficult to experience that state when you're on the motorway, on the freeway, driving in a traffic jam, <laughs> um, or if you're, you know, making food for your kids, but, but it, it seems to be kind of in the background and, um, in quiet moments, yeah, there, are, there are always there are always some quiet moments during the day, and um, so uh, so I I'm able to tune into it. You know, sometimes it takes a, a few moments of reflection of focusing on my breath or just closing my eyes. Um, you know, maybe a few moments of meditation, and then I'm usually able to tune back into it. Mm -hmm. And are you able to teach your children the same kind of skills? Well, um, I don't think you need to. I mean, I, I think young children, my, my kids are, well, one of them is 50. My, I've got three boys, 15, 12, and 9 years old. So I think young children in particular, maybe, maybe up to the age of 8 or 9, they have this natural spirituality. And I don't think they need to do anything I don't think they need to meditate because it's just there. You know, they have this wonderful ability to be present. They have this wonderful, uh, vibrant 
energy inside them, this kind of joie de vivre, natural exhilaration in being alive. And the world is just so fascinating to them. Everything is so exciting. So, you know, you, you don't need to teach children anything, really, at that age. But, um, yeah, I think as they get a bit older, they, they start to lose that a little bit, that natural wakefulness. Um, so I think by the time kids reach teenage years, I think then it's a good time to start to meditate. Um, but, you know, I, I always think of nature as a, a great spiritual, a great source of uh, spiritual experience. So, you know, it's, we like to um, make sure that our kids have, you know, spend quite a lot of time in nature. Mm -hmm. in, in the U.S., I don't know if this is true in the U.K., that teenagers are increasingly anxious and then depressed, especially girls, I think because of so many pressures to do well mm -hmm. in school and they know they're going to have these huge debts when they graduate, so they've got to get a good job to pay for their college tuition and then they've got to look good on social media and get a lot of likes and their Instagram photos. So it, it's actually increasing, especially, mm -hmm. as I say, anxiety in, in girls. Is that true in the UK or not? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's um, yeah. I think it's partly to do with um, social media. Probably the same as in the US, but also exam pressure as well. Yes. Uh, yeah, in the UK, we we've sort of taken on the US style education system with a lot of testing, and uh, it's been quite detrimental to children's well-being. But yeah. um, I like to say to my kids, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, if you fail the fail the test, who cares? You know. It's not that important. Um, but do you still have the A levels and O levels, which are extremely important for getting into university, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah you, can't, you can't get to university without A levels. Mm -hmm. That but is these, a lot of pressure. So, yeah, that's pressure, yeah. You certainly can't get to a good university without good results. So, I mean, the universities are all ranked in terms of, uh, you know, um, the higher status ones. So a lot of you want to get into the higher status universities. So is your 15-year-old feeling that yet, that pressure? No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> he's into football. <laughs> Sorry? He's into football. No, he's not, actually. Uh, but, no, but he's a very chilled-out guy. He doesn't, he doesn't worry about anything. <laughs> he's, he's, um, he's doing okay. He doesn't really feel the pressure. Um, no, he, he's... Um, you know, he, he doesn't get too excited about things, but he doesn't, he doesn't get disappointed about things. He's kind of very stable and very chilled out, so he doesn't feel the pressure. I think maybe our 12-year-old, our he's got a slightly different personality. He's a bit more... Um, um, well, he's, he's less chilled out, a little bit more prone to stress, So maybe he'll feel it when he's older. I'm not, I'm not sure. Hopefully not, but we'll, we'll see. Mm-hmm. Um... Um, I'm asking everyone, when have been the most difficult challenges in your life and how did you cope? And you've already told us one, that your adolescent kind of angst about, you know, who, who am I and because I'm <clears throat> different from other people. Mm -hmm. uh, what about other times when you, when you were really challenged? Um, yeah, that was the most difficult time, really. That probably lasted for, I'd say, 10 years or so. Oh. I only really began to feel um, accepting of myself, to feel comfortable within myself in my late 20s, maybe 28, 29 years old. And that was also a difficult time. That was one of the most difficult times of my life at the end of that period because um, I came back from Germany, where I've been living, came back to England, I, I really sort of felt as I'd lost everything because my relationship with my girlfriend had ended. I left all my friends behind. I left my band. I was in a band in Germany playing music. I left that behind. And I came back to, to England, lived with my parents. And I felt as though I really had to start from scratch. You know, everything was gone. I had to just, you know, I had no career, no job. I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. Um, so I had to sort of begin again from ground zero. So I felt kind of... Um, it was quite interesting in retrospect because I felt kind of destitute in a way. I felt broken down because everything had been taken away. My girlfriend, my band, my job, everything had gone away. Your identity. Your identity. 
Yeah. yeah. And I felt, I felt like one part of me felt as though, you know, I'd lost everything and it was a hopeless situation. But I was aware there was another part of me that was to say, which was saying, you know, I had a sort of intuitive sense that everything was really going to be fine, that I just had to rebuild my life again. And, and, yeah, and, and you know, within a year or two, things had fallen into place and I, was, I, I became really quite contented and fulfilled. I met my, my wife the woman who's my, now my wife at that time. And I, there was a time when I really decided to, to get involved with spirituality too. I started to meditate regularly, gave up smoking, stopped, cut down on drinking, almost you know, pretty much stopped drinking, and became a vegetarian. So I really tried to align my, I tried to rebuild my, rebuild my life in a way that was in alignment with my spiritual um the spiritual side of my nature. So then, you know, my life started to fall into place. Then I, that was when I decided to study transpersonal psychology as well. And from that point, there haven't really been any struggles since that point. You know, I felt as though my life has been uh, flowing very smoothly since then. I mean, I mean having kids is a, you know, that, that is a, a whole set of challenges in itself. Oh, yes. <laughs> so that, that's, that's kind of an ongoing um, you know, challenge. But. Right. Um, so have you, as you've become more, I don't know, disciplined spiritually, had more experience of synchronicity, of precognition, of that, that kind of being in, in touch with the flow? Definitely, yeah. I always um, believed in um, psi phenomena because I occasionally had experiences of them. Of them. Mm-hmm. And but I've always sensed that you know when things are going well, when I'm in alignment with my spiritual self, then synchronicities do occur. I had this feel. I had this feeling that things kind of naturally work out. You know, um, it happens a lot with books. When I'm writing a book, things seem to fall into place very easily. Um, I just had an example yesterday, actually. Because um, I had a, an interest from a, from a publisher in a book called Extraordinary Awakenings about people who experienced spiritual awakenings in very extreme circumstances like combat, uh, bereavement, uh, incarceration, prisoners who experienced spiritual awakening and so on. Um, so yeah, a publisher was interested in wanting to see a summary of the book, uh, you know, a chapter summary. And... I was thinking, yeah, I think I've got a lot of, uh, from my research, I've got a lot of cases, but the one area where I don't have many cases is incarceration. I've got a couple of examples of prisoners who experienced awakening, but only two, I think I need more than two, maybe three or four examples. So somebody just wrote to me yesterday, out of the blue, with this amazing story of uh, mm -hmm. a spiritual transformation that occurred when he was incarcerated for six months. Mm -hmm. So things like that happen quite a lot when I'm, I'm writing, those kind of synchronicities. Right, yeah, me too. <coughs> Um, so, how did you, you've written seven books in 19 languages, written articles in over 40 journals, the uh, magazine Mind, Body, Spirit magazine said you're number 72 <laughs> in the 100 oh. most spiritually, <laughs> yeah. spiritually influential people, so uh, I'm, I'm just curious how you have time for that, being family work, writing, speaking, poetry, living. Mm. Yeah, it's, um, <laughs> it's, it's challenging sometimes. But I just, um, I'm quite a disciplined person. And I've sort of developed the ability to write in any circumstances. So I can write on trains, in airport lounges, on airplanes. I can write in any situation, even in a, a busy you know, even in a, a bar, you know, waiting in a bar somewhere, drinking a coffee, I can write. So I've just developed this very disciplined ability to write in any situation. Uh, so, and so now I write, I write quite quickly. It takes me maybe six months to, to write a book. Mm. Um, so I think, I think just by necessity, I've just learned to be quite disciplined and also to be able to tune into the, you know, the creative side of my being quite quickly. You know, I never... The idea of writer's block or something like that never 
It's never happened to me. Me either. Uh, I haven't got time for writer's block. So. <laughs> um, what I find is I can't write if it's quiet. I have to have on yeah. like classical music or something. I, it's distracting to me if it's too quiet. Yeah. Well, yeah, but I find that if, I'm, if I am in a cafe or an airport lounge, then I like to put music on headphones just because it helps me tune out of the environment. So, yeah, music. I like listening to music, too. Yeah, and airplanes are a great place to write because you there's no distractions. You can't get up and get tea or yeah. answer the phone or something. I get I I wrote a book for kids about surviving a parent's divorce on a flight from um, Bali to the U.S. It, it was a tiny little Garuda plane, so the person behind you, if they moved, they bumped you. So there was no way to sleep. So I just hmm. outlined that book. Oh, uh, right. <laughs> Um, so how many books have you written? Twenty. Twenty. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, on different topics. Um, so do you think of yourself as number seventy-two most spiritually influential people? In, I guess in the English-speaking world. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's. Um, I mean, it's it's, it's strange, isn't it? Because. Um, you know, I, maybe I could think of myself in those terms, but then I get back home and, you know, it's time to unload the dishwasher or time to, um, you know, to mess around, play around with the kids, to play about in the garden with the kids. So, no, I think, I think having a family is quite grounding. Um, but you must have people that write to you and say, oh, I, that was so transformative for me, or here's my experience. Oh, yeah, all the time, yeah, maybe several times a week I get those type of emails. But, I, I you know, I, I think of it in, um, I don't really think of it in personal terms. I feel that um, I'm making a, a contribution, I'm trying to make a contribution, I'm making a contribution, and it's not really up to me, it's, it's something that's coming through me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe if I, if I became too conscious of it, I'd get in the way of it. If I developed a sense of self-importance, it would, it would start to obstruct it. So I, I just feel as though I have a, a role to play. You know, I feel as though I'm, you know, I'm helping the evolution of the human race. I'm trying to uh, contribute to a movement beyond our present state of being, a movement towards awakening, if you like. Well, so, when, when I think of awakening, I think of enlightenment. I think of Buddha sitting under the Bodhi tree until... He had understanding of how the the universe operates, kind of the thing. So, is it? Do you equate awakening and enlightenment in your work? Yeah, I do, but um, I don't. I don't try to. I don't use the term enlightenment very much, because on the, on the one hand, it's a mistranslation of the Buddhist term bodhi, which literally is closer to awakening. Ah. Um, and also, for a lot of people, enlightenment suggests something quite, you know, very, very rarefied, um, a kind of state which is almost impossible to reach, a state of, you know, complete escape from complete transcendence. But, you know, I, I think there are lots of different degrees of awakening. Some people have a very high level, of, very intense level of wakefulness. Some people, a lot of people have a kind of lower intensity level of wakefulness. And, and it's an ongoing process, you know, it's not, it's not either or. You're not either asleep or enlightened. There are lots of gradations. And it's much more accessible than the term enlightenment applies, implies. You know, I'm, I've, from my research, I recognize that there are thousands of seemingly ordinary people who have attained some degree of awakening, usually through some degree of suffering, some degree of psychological turmoil. It's quite, quite common and... A lot of these people don't have any background in spirituality. They, they wouldn't even interpret what's happened to them in terms of awakening or enlightenment or spiritual experience. They just know that they feel different. They feel like they're living a different life as a different person. They feel more connected, more appreciative. Life is much more meaningful and so on. So, yeah, so that's why I prefer the term wakefulness or awakening. Where do you find your case studies? Do they just come to you because of your books? 
Sometimes, yeah. Or, um, or occasionally I, like, for example, two years ago, myself and a colleague, we decided we wanted to research uh, transformational experiences in the context of bereavement. Um, so we, we, we advertised on you know, social media. And sometimes, you know, somebody told us, you know, you need to speak to my friend, blah, blah, she's had this kind of experience. So, yeah, sometimes people come to me, but sometimes we make, we make a conscious attempt to reach people. And is, so is your next outreach to prisoners? To prisoner? Well, um, yeah. Well, in, in general, at the moment, I'm interested in awakening experiences in extraordinary circumstances. And... So one area is combat. I found um, mm -hmm. quite a few examples of soldiers in combat zones having spiritual experiences. And in some cases, um, having permanent experiences of trans permanent transformation, uh, you know, permanent wakefulness. So, you know, I'm, I'm interested in collecting those examples and also incarceration, yeah. I've, I've been in contact with a guy who's been in prison in America. Well, I've actually been in contact with his lawyer, um, and I'm hoping to speak to him in person soon. But he's um, been in prison since the age of 15. He was convicted of murder at the age of 15, and he's been denied parole repeatedly. So 39 years later, he's still in prison. What state is that? Is that? Uh, I can't remember, to be honest. It's probably uh, the south. It is the south. Maybe Texas, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's incredible. You know, he's, he was denied parole this year and last year again. But apparently, you know, he's completely accepting of his situation. He's had a, a transformational experience after, you know, so many years in prison. Hmm. Um, yeah, so I, I've, I'm in contact with a couple of people. Um, that kind of experience. In, in your spiritual science book, you, you, you talk about a pan-spiritist view that would that would transcend conventional science and conventional religion. So, as you said, it, it, that pan-spiritist view explains consciousness, quantum mechanics, placebo, neuroplasticity, NDEs, evolution. So that, that's, a, that's a broad, sweeping conclusion. Tell us about that. Well, um, in spiritual science, I'm suggesting that the normal model of science, the materialist model of science, doesn't actually explain the world. It doesn't explain the world very well. You know, there are lots of seemingly anomalous phenomena which materialist science just sweeps away and disregards because it can't explain them. And even, you know, the accepted phenomena of science, it doesn't really explain them very well, like consciousness, like evolution. Um, it doesn't really offer satisfying explanations of them. So I'm suggesting that if you replace the materialist model of science with the spiritual model of science. Basically, if you just replace materialism with the idea that there is a, a spiritual force, oh yeah, I, I sometimes call it fundamental consciousness. You could call it consciousness or spirit, but it's kind of like the fundamental reality, the ground reality of the universe. Maybe it even precedes the universe. Maybe I suggest that the universe is actually the expression of this ground reality this fundamental consciousness or spirit. A lot, you know, a lot of cultures around the world have similar ideas. Um, so the idea that you know, the world was created when Brahman breathed out, you know, brought the world, the universe is the outbreath of Brahman. It's a very similar idea. But if you, if you accept this idea that the fundamental ground reality universe is consciousness or spirit, then all of these things begin to make sense. You can explain consciousness because the brain doesn't produce consciousness. It's a, like a... It's the receiver of consciousness. It's the transmitter of consciousness. And that also explains the influence of the mind over the body because the mind is a more subtle expression of consciousness than the body. The body is also consciousness, but the mind is a more subtle expression, so the mind is kind of ontologically more fundamental than the body. So the mind can influence, influence the body. So things like the placebo effect, um, Phenomena like phantom pregnancy, like the influence of um, how the body can be changed under hypnosis and so on. Or they, you know, my favorite sense. example is disassociative identity disorder. That's so clear that one alter can have 
a disease and the other doesn't have it. To me, that's the best evidence right there. Yeah, yeah. And, um, uh, you know, the things, and, and almost when we're like telepathy begin to make sense because there was fundamentally no separation. We're all expressions of the same consciousness. And therefore, you know, it should be possible in certain circumstances for us to tune into each other's thoughts and to, to pick up each other's intentions. And altruism makes sense too because we are interconnected. We can empathize with each other. We can sense each other's suffering. And therefore, we have an impulse to to alleviate each other's suffering. And things like, you know, I, I explain spiritual experiences as a, as a kind of um, a connection with our fundamental oneness, you know, a, a connection with our fundamental essence of pure consciousness. And because all the whole world, the whole world is the expression of this consciousness, this fundamental consciousness, there's a sense of oneness with all things, because all things are, are literally one. All things are fundamentally one. And we can sense that oneness in deep states of meditation or in intense spiritual experiences. And things like near-death experiences, they begin to make sense, you know. Um, the idea of an after, of some form of afterlife becomes acceptable as well. So as soon as you include this idea that there is a fundamental essence of spirit or consciousness which is everywhere and in everything, then science begins to make a lot more sense. What, what about if, how does it explain that you could say that we're getting worse, the world situation, we're destroying the planet, the inequality is increasing, autocrats are increasing, we have the Trump clones around the world. So if there's this unity that connects us all, how can we be so cruel as to fight wars and allow children around the world to be malnourished and die of starvation when we're so rich? Yeah, good, good point. Well, the problem is it's the, I guess you could call it the ego. You know, the ego obstructs our fundamental oneness. The ego stands in the way of our fundamental oneness. You know, I, I, um, I wrote a book called The Fall, and it was partly a study of indigenous cultures around the world, but also prehistoric cultures. And I suggested that um, prehistoric and indigenous cultures didn't have the same strong sense of ego that modern peoples have. We didn't have this, they didn't have this sense of being separate entities living inside their bodies in separation from the environment, in separation from other individuals. They had this fundamental sense of connection to, to nature, to their communities, to their own bodies. But there was a time in history when a change seems to have occurred. A human being seems to have developed this. In some human beings, some human, gr human groups seem to have developed this intense sense of individu individuality. Would, and I call it the fall, you see, you know. And then they lost this sense of connection. Would, Marx would probably say that happened with private property and agriculture, that we, we was the time of the fall? Well, yeah, that's right. But I, I would turn it the other way around. I'd say that private property came into existence because of this psychological change. And I suggest that um, not just private property, but... Uh, male domination. I think Marx talks about male domination as well. Uh, patriarchy. Uh, warfare as well. Warfare. There's a lot of evidence that early human cultures were peaceful. There's very little evidence for warfare until about 4000 BC. Then warfare just seems to become endemic. It seems to be everywhere after that. So all of these cultural changes, I suggest, were caused by this psychological change, this, this new sense of intensified ego, this sense of individuality which suddenly develops. But was there an impetus? It didn't just pop out of the out of the ether, right? Was there there were no. technological changes or something? Well well it, it, it seems to have occurred in certain human groups, particularly in Central Asia and Southern Europe around from around four thousand BC. They were the cultures which became warlike. Uh, patriarchal, and um, they also developed the, the first kind of theistic religions, polytheistic religions, which later became monotheistic. So there, there's some evidence that it was connected to a major environmental change, which occurred at that time. It was basically desertification. Uh, there, were, there were lots of areas in, um, in, in that part of the world which 
had been very fertile, but over a few centuries they became they became very arid, hmm. very, des very desiccated. So the cultural change seems to have been connected to this new, this massive process of desertification, which occurred at that time. Maybe it was survival practices. Maybe people had to develop a new sense of individuality to survive because survival became much more difficult at that time in those areas. So it was a survival of the fittest, kind of a neo-Darwinist thing? Possibly, yeah. I mean, maybe that's what I suggest. You know, there, there are no, there's no, you know, hard and fast answer, but, but maybe it was, it seems to have definitely been connected to this environmental change because it occurred at exactly the same time. And maybe it just demanded a new kind of individuality just to survive, a new kind of, not just individuality, but a new kind of abstract intelligence. And that's when, you know, technology really flourished at that time. A lot of um, technological innovations came into being at that time. So it seems to have demanded a new kind of abstract, practical intelligence, which probably was associated with the ego. Um, some scholars have said that the matriarchal <clears throat> cultures were peace-loving and, um, you know, sharing and cooperative and egalitarian, like in Crete. Um, and then other scholars have said, no, there's really no evidence of that. Where, where do you, what did you find about the, the early matriarchal cultures? Well, there's definitely evidence, like I said, that warfare became much more intense later on in history. I mean, there are lots of, it's even a pretty much a, an accepted viewpoint now in anthropology that warfare is a, a late, fairly late development in human history. And it was definitely connected with our, um, agriculture, farming, you know, the first set settlements. Um, but I, th I think there's a lot of evidence that, I mean, I, I'm reluctant to call these societies matriarchal because I think they were just egalitarian. I, I don't think they were patriarchal or matriarchal. Mm. It's kind of non-triarchal, if that's a word. <laughs> but um, they were they were just egalitarian. There was no hierarchy between different gen the two different genders, and you know, like Crete is a good example. There's loads of evidence that ancient Crete, before 2000 BC, ancient Crete didn't have any evidence of warfare, um, and women definitely had a high status. And also, you know, if you go to ancient Crete and you go to the museums and go to the the Palace of Knossos, then there's just this really vibrant atmosphere in the artwork. There's this sense that people really revered nature. There were so many images of beautiful natural phenomena. And it's completely different to later cultures where there was this kind of worship of warfare in, in artwork. And you know, Zeus and Thor and the Thunderbolt yeah. and Yahweh. Yeah, nature seems to disappear and it just been, just just be placed with brutal images of warfare and gods and, and so forth. So I think there was definitely some kind of major psychological change which occurred. Um, I'm thinking about current day bush people in in um, in Africa. That I've read that they all share the baby. Everybody will hold the baby or take care of it, and they they cooperate in net hunting. Mm. There there aren't hierarchies in the same way, except maybe older people are re respected for having more wisdom or something. But there's it's it's not patriarchal. No, no. That's one of the things that I've written about in um, in spiritual science. Is that the standard view of evolution is full of uh, fallacies. Right. And one of them is that um, that human history is a, has been this kind of crazy, savage, brutal competition for survival. Right. Which has led to us being very individualistic and very competitive and and very materialistic and greedy. Uh, but it's nonsense. It doesn't fit with the archaeological or anthropological evidence at all. You know, the archaeological and anthropological evidence shows that human beings who live a, a simple hunter-gatherer lifestyle, the same kind of lifestyle which we lived for throughout most of our time on this planet, that those communities are very egalitarian, very cooperative. Uh, there's, you know, you know, people don't. There's no private property. Just like Marx said about primitive communism, there's no private property, no gender inequality. And, yeah, it's not competitive at all. It's cooperative rather than competitive. And even, you know, within different groups, there's no competition within the groups. But even within, sorry, even between different groups, there's this idea that human groups would just fight with each other over territory, over resources. And that's not true either, you know. 
different tribes have a lot of contact with each other. They cultivate ties with each other. And they tend to be, you know, they share territory and goods with each other. You know, there's very little conflict between different tribes. So I think, you know, the, the standard idea of evolution is this kind of brutal competition. It's, it's a fallacy based on modern society. It's kind of like a reflection of a the competitive projection. nature. Of, yeah. They're just seeing it through the lens of, you know, industrial, modern capitalist industrial economies. You say that the view that evolution happens by random mutations can't be true because that would take too long. So are, are you suggesting that there's some kind of um, guide or, you know, intelligent evolution? Well, yeah, I, I would call it um, purposeful or teleological evolution. And that's, you know, that's an accepted concept in biology now, adaptive mutation. Um, you know, it's, it's very well accepted that in certain situations, um, mutations will occur in a non-random way. They just occur as they are needed in, re in response to environmental challenges. Like the food source. There's some, I think Bruce Lipton has some kind of experiment with sugar and then the yeast will rapidly change so they could uh, use that kind of food source. That's right, yeah. If, this, if, um, if there are bacteria which are not able to produce, uh, to... to um, process lactose and you place them in a lactose rich solution then within a short amount of time they'll mutate so that they become able to process lactose um, and that's impossible in random terms so it's completely you know it would take thousands of years for that for that, for that to happen in a random way but it happens naturally because I think I think there's a certain creativity in life forms which allows them to respond to environmental challenges I think there, there is definitely a direction, there's a creativity in life forms, and there's also a directional tendency in evolution, which moves towards, you know, say an impetus, you could say. There's an impetus in evolution, which moves towards greater complexity and more intense consciousness. Mm -hmm. So that, that's really profound, because it implies there is some kind of ground of being <clears throat> that is creative or conscious. And, and that also ties into this new concern about epigenetics, that our environment changes how our genes express, right? Mm hmm Yeah, well, I mean, uh, there, there are a lot of biologists now who believe that the standard neo-Darwinist view of evolution is just too simplistic, and that you can't explain evolution in terms of random genetic mutations and natural selection. Um, so, you know, all, all of these... Um, different phenomena or different aspects of evolution, like epigenetics, symbiogenesis, and adaptive mutation. These are all kind of factors which modern biologists are becoming aware of. And, you know, you, you, can, you can interpret them in different ways. But I think that um, my interpretation is that fundamental consciousness of spirit, the kind of ground reality of the universe, it has a certain creative potential. It has a kind of dynamic quality. It's not kind of like a, an inert um, field of consciousness. It actually has a kind of dynamic quality. And that's, what, what, that's how the universe came into being. The universe came into being as an expression of, of fundamental consciousness. And that's, that kind of urge to express itself, that dynamism continues to express itself in evolution. It, it impels evolution to move towards greater complexity, and more intense consciousness. Um, so, you know, human beings, we, we are the expression of this evolutionary impulse. And I think that ties into our, our urge to grow in a spiritual way. I think the urge to follow spiritual paths and practices is an expression of this evolutionary impulse. Basically, when we, um, when we follow a spiritual path or a practice, we're trying to expand and intensify our consciousness which is what evolution has been doing, you know, for the past few million, well, hundreds of millions of years. So, you know, we're, we're just expressing that same impulse. That, that's really a, a profound paradigm shift. I mean, that, that's, that's a huge shift. And so it's no wonder that <clears throat> there's a lot of resistance 
from people who have the materialist paradigm drummed into them from school and on up. So mm -hmm. my, my question is, do you experience resistance who, from people who say, oh, Steve Taylor is way out there? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, well, funny, funny enough, um, not really. Um, because I think I, I have a strong feeling that the, the paradigm is shifting. You know, even in terms of psi phenomena, um, I thought when I became, when I started to write about psi phenomena and declared that I believed in them, I, I thought there was, you know, significant evidence for them and I don't see why they shouldn't exist. I thought I'd get a lot of resistance from my academic colleagues and, and from skeptics. But I haven't, you know, I've had quite a bit of support. And, um, you know, even um, the American... The Journal of the American Psychological Association, which I think it's called, I can't remember what it's called now, the American Psychologist, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. They published a, a very positive article on psych phenomena last year. Wow. Um, and that, that would have never happened 15 years ago because there was so much uh, antipathy towards psy researchers. Um, and like I say, in, in, even in biology, a lot of people are, are suggesting that neo Darwinism is just far too simplistic. It can't be true because it's just ignores so many different aspects of evolution and ignores this adaptive, creative potential in evolution. So I think, you know, the, I think there is a, a change underway. There, I mean, obviously there are still many materialists and skeptics around, but I think there's slowly, you know, an opening uh, taking place. Um, you, you mentioned symbiotics, and I don't know what that is. Um... Oh, I was talking about symbiogenesis? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's, it's basically the idea that, um, that evolution works through cooperation. Yeah, we mentioned the idea that evolution is supposedly a, a competitive process. Yeah, survival um, of the fittest. Yeah, that's the way we've been taught to think of it. Yeah. Right, right down to the beginnings of life, it's about genes and molecules fighting against each other. But, um, you know, symbiogenesis suggests that cooperation is actually the main uh, source of evolution. That evolution can't work without cooperation. Which is Even at the, level, the levels of genes and molecules, they have to cooperate <coughs> with And there's this, um, you know, yeah, there's basically the theory that cooperation is essential in evolution, not just competition. I mean, even Darwin said this. You know, Darwin, you know, Darwin was not a neo-Darwinist. And... <laughs> and um, he wouldn't have accepted some of you know the modern ideas from neo Darwinists. So he, he wrote a lot about uh, altruism and cooperation, and he he believed he admitted towards the end of his life that he put too much emphasis on the notion of the uh, of um, natural selection, and he'd not put enough emphasis on cooperation and altruism. You know, I've been reading about the mu municipalist movement that's kind of headquartered in Barcelona <clears throat> and Mayor Ada Colau, however you say her name, and there's this growing movement throughout the world for um, cities to take leadership, but with feminization of politics they talk about. And mm -hmm. feminization of politics means cooperation rather than than competition and not saying mm -hmm. I'm the mayor, I I know everything, and I'm the dominant male. That you're humble and say I don't understand this. Let's let's ask all the people in this neighborhood what they think. So it's interesting that it's it's happening on that municipalist movement. Just just what you're implying. Yeah, yeah. I think I think we're living through an interesting time. Because on the one hand, as you said before, there, there was a lot of um, nationalism. There seems to have been a kind of a reversion towards um, nationalism and individualism and materialism. But on the other hand, there's, there's a very strong movement in the opposite direction towards increased interest in spirituality, increased cooperation, and, you know, a movement away from neuroscientific perspectives and from mechanistic perspectives on health. So, yeah, we're living in, um, I suppose it's, you know, it's, it's not coincidental that these two extremes are manifesting themselves at the same time. I sometimes think that the, the, the tendency towards nationalism and patriarchy and individualism, that's becoming more 
powerful in resistance to this opposing trend. You know, this is opposing trend of awakening, and the old sort of patriarchal values are trying to trying to assert themselves more strongly because they're feeling threat threatened. I, I think that's what Trump is. He's like the shadow from the past, bringing all the the shadow to the surface so that we can let it go. Yeah, yeah. Certainly, it's a you know I think. The old ego, the kind of separate patriarchal ego, you know, it's, it's still there, obviously. And I think it's feeling threatened because there is this process of awakening and a, a process of increasing empathy and increasing cooperation. So I think it's really trying to, it's becoming more rigid and trying to become more powerful in, in resistance to these, you know, these opposed, opposing trends. Yeah, it's really interesting, the new young women of color in Congress who are just speaking out and <clears throat> causing so many waves. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's just like a perfect <clears throat> confrontation of the Trump old patriarchal guy and the new young women of color who are just telling it like it is and not yeah. afraid. Yeah, it's interesting because <clears throat> I think of um, you know, Donald Trump and the people who are similar to them you know, in, in spiritual terms, they are very deeply asleep. You know, they're, they're very individualistic. They're very egocentered. All, all of the sort of qualities of spirituality, they, they lack those, you know, in a very extreme way. So, you know, it's, it's strange that there is this process of awakening happening. At the same time, you know, the, the old values, the, the people who are most asleep are also becoming more, more, power, more powerful. Well, do you find that happening in politics in the UK? I mean, what I just hear of Jeremy Corman is as that he's an old patriarchal guy. I don't know who the the young voices of um, of e equality are in the UK. Um, oh, by the way, am I too dark now? It's because the the lights are fading here. Should I turn the lights on or? I think you're I... fine. Oh, okay. Um, well. I don't know, it's, it's, uh, politics in England is quite strange, because uh, it's always been sort of, we've never really had figures like Donald Trump, um, <laughs> the politicians in this country are quite kind of mediocre, they're kind of like, you know, ordin very ordinary, they're not particularly charismatic. You had Margaret Thatcher. Oh yeah, she was, um, she was a, a strange anomaly, anomaly, uh, um, that's true, yeah. Well, apart from Margaret Thatcher, they've been quite in inconsequential figures. Um, but um, at the same time, like I say, you know, there is this um, interest in mindfulness. You know, the, apparently there's a group of 200 or more MPs who get together every week to practice mindfulness. Wow. And um, yeah, I think there are, there are some people of integrity in this country in politics. <laughs> and, you know, they're obviously some mendacious figures too but you know i mean jeremy corbyn i'm not a great fan of his but he, he's a man of integrity he's a man of principles he's not self-centered um so you know he even he is a he's not a, not at all a mendacious figure he's a you know he's a, he's a basically a, a socialist an old school socialist but basically a, a good man i'd say so i don't know it's not it's not hopeless in this country there's no but nobody is um extreme as the, you know, as the Republican Party. Um, there's a small group of people who are kind of extre as extreme right-wing as that, but not to the same degree, I don't think. Um, to kind of uh, change the subject, you, you said, like Don Juan and Carlos Castaneda's books, that we should live, well, Don Juan said we should live as if death is on, is on our left shoulder. So uh, what do you mean when, we, when we, you say we should consider death in our life? Well, I, I found from my research that um, death, intense encounters with death, are, are one of the major sources of transformation. Mm -hmm. uh, so when people have um, um, a serious illness like cancer, maybe they're told by the doctor that they maybe only have a few months or what, a year left to live. Or maybe they have a, a heart attack which almost kills them. Uh, maybe they have a near-death experience. But when you have that intense encounter with death, that can be very liberating, and very transforming. It can instantly bring about a shift into awakening. 
Um, so, you know, what, what's really happening there is that people are becoming aware of the reality of death. So for most of us, death isn't really a reality. You know, I think, I think there's something inside the human psyche which makes us blissfully unaware of the reality of death. Yeah. Um, and so, so when you actually do become aware of the reality of death, suddenly everything changes. You realize that life is temporary, it's fragile, it's precious. So some, some things become more meaningless and other things become more meaningful. You know, things like creativity, um, love. love, yeah, altruism, self-development, spirituality. These things become much more important. But things like, uh, I don't know, caring about your appearance, keeping up with the neighbors, you know, promotion in your job. Things like that just are not important anymore. Um, so, yeah, there's a natural, an encounter with death. Well, not just an encounter with death, but an awareness of death can have a liberating, awakening effect. Right. Um, you, you also <clears throat> are interested in time and how we can change how we relate to time. Can you explain that? Well, um, partly that comes from my interest in, in higher states of consciousness. Because one of the characteristics of higher states of consciousness, certainly at a, a very intense level, well, let's call them awakening experiences. One of the characteristics of awakening experiences is a, a shift in a person's sense of time. So often time seems to become meaningless. There's a sense of stepping outside time. Or even a sense that time seems to expand. You know, suddenly time seems to open up. Or in, maybe in some way the past and the future collapse into the present moment. So there's kind of like an, the mystics call it the eternal now. The sense that the whole of the future and the whole of the past was contained in the present. Uh. And, but in any, in any case, there's a shift. There's a sense of stepping outside our normal sense of linear time. And that can also happen in accidents. A lot of people say when they have a car accident that time suddenly seems to slow down. Um, it could happen in any emergency situation. It's, it's a common feature of emergency situations that time seems to slow down drastically. So that, that suggests to me that time is a construct of, of the, the normal sense of self or the normal self system. And that, you know, um, by changing or stepping outside our normal or deconstructing our normal sense of self, you can also step outside the normal sense of linear time. I know I've also, because of that, I was, I was also interested in why time seems to why people seem to perceive time in different ways in different situations. Like, you know, why, why does it get faster as we get older? Why does it slow down when we're bored? And, you know, why do, why do children have such a, a slow down sense of time? And, and so forth. Well, it, what's interesting to me is that physicists know that um, time isn't linear. And psi mm. experience show that you can influence the past or read into the future. So our our whole concept of a linear time do 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 isn't isn't really accurate. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there, there is a lot of support from for that idea from uh, quantum physics, particularly. But even even in standard physics, you know, the idea of um, time is more is like space. You know, it's kind of like spread out in every direction at the same time. You know, the past, future, and present are like an ocean which is going to spread out in a panorama. So there's no sense of linear time. It's more panoramic, like space. That's the way that you know, time is viewed in, in modern physics. And certainly in quantum physics, um, the kind of the linear linearity of, of time breaks down altogether. And sometimes um, you know, some physicists have suggested that in the quantum world, uh, the normal sequence of cause and effect is reversed so that the effect can occur before, sorry, after the cause, you know, so the standard causality can be reversed. Mm -hmm. And there's also the transactional theory of quantum physics, which suggests that what happens in the present is a result of waves from the future and the past coalescing in the present. Wow. So again, there's no, you know, the idea of linear time doesn't really apply. And <clears throat> the idea of quantum entanglement that if you change the spin on this entangled photon, the one <clears throat> here instantaneously changes. There's there's no explanation for that in terms of linear time either. 
No, no, yeah, that those entangle, entanglement effects occur across distance, across time. You know, there was there was there was an experiment in 2017 in China, um, which showed that entanglement occurred. I think it was about 700 kilometers. Uh, they they had a, one particle was in a space station, 700 meet, 700 kilometers above the Earth. The other particle was here on the surface of the Earth, and they were still entangled over 700 kilometers. And those researchers also managed to teleport one particle to the other. Um, so yeah, entanglement is proof that standard ideas of time and space and causality, you know, are too, well, the standard views are too simplistic. Well, are you saying they, they didn't just change the spin of the particle, but they, they moved it up to the space station? Yeah, they, they claim to teleport the particles to wow. each, uh, the, par the particle on Earth to the one uh, in the space station. Wow. Uh, I think they just transferred the qualities of the particles in some way, so that in effect, the one became the other. Hmm. You, you also mentioned somewhere that the Chinese are doing some kind of experiment why with your thought you can remove, I think in this case it was seeds from a jar and take the seeds out of the jar. Does that ring a bell? No, no. It's something that you read. I'll have to find it. Yeah? Um, yeah, I'll find it. Um, I don't. Uh. You also talk about the kind of the psychology of happiness. Does that imply that we can um, influence our state of happiness to become more happy? Oh, definitely, yeah. I, I teach a module on positive psychology at my university. And, yeah, the, the standard insight there is that, you know, we are not passive, passive, um, you know, we, we have control of our own mood and there are certain things we can do in terms of the way we think, the way we live our lives, and also in terms of our actual state of being that can influence our, our happiness. Um, yeah, there's, you know, there are many... There are many scientific studies that show that um, changing your attitude, like developing a more appreciative attitude, and also... Gratitude. Gratitude, gratitude is really powerful. Yeah, yeah, gratitude is, is the single most powerful quality in well-being. If you develop a sense of gratitude, which you can, you can cultivate it, and once you do that, it kind of spreads through every area of your life, and you develop, you develop a kind of buoyancy and a... Um, a very, you know, you know, a deep state of well-being as a result. Mm -hmm. I, I find if I just say, I'm grateful for da-da-da, or I'm happy, I feel better. <laughs> just simple. Yeah, or just making a, a conscious effort. I mean, uh, just two weeks ago on my positive psychology module, I told my students to, there's, this, there's an exercise called the three good things exercise. It's very simple. That every night before you go to bed, you write down three good things that have happened that have happened during the day, and you think about why they happened and you know what the consequences of these things were, and just being conscious of these things of good, the good things in your life induces a, a state of well-being. Uh, I guess it's just like counting your blessings. Just I think there's something in human beings which makes us uh, take things for granted. We tend to switch off to the things in our life that we should appreciate. You know, we take people for granted. We take health for granted. We take the fact of being alive itself for granted yeah. because we're not aware of death. So if you make a conscious effort to, to be aware of these blessings, then it, it can have a, you know, a, a very powerful effect. I'm, I'm really interested in your study of the origins of social pathology like inequality because inequality is a big concern of mine. But before you discuss that, I think it's time to turn on the lights, if you don't mind. Okay. <laughs> Much better. Thank you. Yeah, it's nearly uh, it's 20 to 6 here now, so it's starting to get dark. Yeah. So social pathologies that um, the, there, you can say that there's a you can analyze the rise of so of inequality as a pathology 
Yeah, you can um, in archaeological terms because, um, as I said before, there's a lot of evidence that um, prehistoric cultures were generally egalitarian, just like um, a lot of indigenous cultures were generally egalitarian. And the first hierarchical societies seem to have come into being around 4000 BC uh, in certain areas of the world. And those cultures were also very warlike and they had, you know, very advanced technology. So they conquered other cultures very easily. You know, they went to Crete, for example. Yeah. You know, the main Greeks went to Crete and conquered Crete and it became a, a patriarchal society. And uh, so they spread over the, they spread over the whole world. Eventually, they went to North America, and they went to Australia more recently. But even before then, they spread over Europe and the Middle East and Asia, these kind of dominant, uh, patriarchal, technologically advanced warlike societies. And they would, you know, they would conquer the kind of egalitarian indigenous groups. In some cases, they would, um, you know, sort of intermingle with them and interbreed with them. Um, but yeah, slowly over, over thousands of years, over, over hundreds of thousands of years, there was this process of migration by which the patriarch society spread over the whole world, you know. Um, so now most of the world is part of this, um, you know, patriarchal, um, patriarchal community, you, you could say. Even though, you know, as we discussed, there's a movement away from that now, but... Certainly, the you know the theistic theistic religions are a part of it too. Um, Male-dominated societies, warfare, hierarchy—they're all a part of this um, this movement. You know, what interested me in academia is that I read a book called *Chimpanzee Politics* by Franz Duwall, and he talked okay. about the, the dominant hierarchies and how the chimps, the alphas curry favor and form coalitions and and it seemed very much like the university and so I thought in some ways we're still acting like our primate relatives and the dominance hierarchies the little political struggles um, and so it's it's really inbred in us that these kind of dominance hierarchies but then you're making the point that traditional indigenous people didn't have those kind of hierarchies yeah, I mean, I've read about um, chimpanzee cult, uh, communities and also bonobos. Yeah, well, those and are so different because they cooperate with sex. Yeah, yeah, they're very egalitarian, very yeah. uh, matriarchal. Yeah, <laughs> and but even chimpanzee, I think the the aggression and uh, hierarchical nature of chimpanzee communities has been over exaggerated. Ah. Um, yeah, there there are a lot of studies that show that. Chimpanzees become especially hierarchical and especially aggressive when their um, when their living space is disrupted or disturbed, usually by anthropologists, or when their feeding patterns are disrupted. Mm. Just like human beings, you know, human beings, human communities become very disturbed when they live in you know overcrowded areas, when they're poor by poverty and so on, lack of contact with nature and so on. And um, but yeah, commu chimpanzee communities when they're when they've been observed in completely natural situations, usually just by video cameras with no anthropologists present, when communities are completely undisturbed and completely natural, then they have much lower levels of violence, much lower levels of hierarchy. And so, yeah, and even, you know, there, there, are, there, are, there are studies of the levels of violence over decades in chimpanzee communities. And even the ones which have been observed, even when communities are violent, they're much less violent than human communities. It's actually only a very low level of violence to begin with. But as I say, when they are observed in completely natural, undisturbed surroundings, the level of violence is much lower. They're much closer to bonobos, much more similar to bonobos. <laughs> and bonobos are just as similar to human beings as chimpanzees are. They are they're just as closely related to us as chimpanzees are. And, but, you know, they're... But the example of bonobos points towards um, a fundamental egalitarianism and, uh, um, you know, peacefulness and altruism. Bonobos can be very altruistic. But that shows how biased science is by the patriarchy that we, uh, we focused on the chimps and not the bonobos. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, why do we love chimps and not bonobos? You know, <laughs> that's interesting. Um, yeah. But what, what I'd like to finish up with talking about um, some of the your your courses that you've developed. You you have um, external courses for people who could take anywhere, and then you have the master's degree. And so, could you say a word about what kind of academic offerings that you give people in these topics? Yeah, well, um, we have a, a master's degree in interdisciplinary psychology, which is mainly transpersonal psychology or spiritual psychology. And we also have PhD students. Um, and because uh, the main area of my academic life is researching transformational experiences. So I tend to supervise PhD students who are investigating similar experiences, you know, uh, PhD students who want to investigate the effects of spiritual awakening or the, the circumstances in which spiritual awakening occurs. And um, yeah, I also teach on an online master's degree, uh, which, which is through Liverpool John Morrison University, and that's called Consciousness, Spirituality and Transpersonal Psychology. And I also do a lot of public talks on you know, transpersonal psychology or spirituality, and uh, just to, yeah, I think, I think it's important for, for academics to engage with the public and, you know, kind of disseminate ideas into, the, into popular discourse. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of how you stay balanced, do you still play music or are you uh, not, not have time for it? Uh, well, I play on my own. I, think I have my guitar here, actually, just oh, yeah. next to me. <laughs> I'll show you my guitar. Oh, good. This is, this is a bass guitar, uh, but I've got like four or five guitars. Uh -huh. uh, I've got piano downstairs, uh, a drum, a drum set as well. So um, yeah, I play music, but not not in a group anymore. Just on my own. I just love to relax by picking up my guitar and you know finding little little tunes or little pieces to play. So I, I just improvise. I just pick up a guitar and improvise, and it's a great way of. Um, Relaxing and quietening my mind, and it was a great way of sort of opening myself to, you know, creativity to to allow music to come through me. Do you write song lyrics as well as poems? I used to, but um, but now that I'm not in a band, um, I used to write songs for the band, you know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. But you know, if you're not in a band, there's not really much um, motivation to write songs. So now, nowadays, I just um, play music instrumentally without, without singing or without words. Mm -hmm. um, I, also, I, don't, I don't like to rhyme. You know, cause <laughs> poetry, I like poetry to be, to be spontaneous and to be a, um, you know, to express experience in a very pure, pure way. I think once you start rhyming, then it moves away from spontaneity and, and purity. So I don't like to rhyme. If you write songs, you have to rhyme. Oh, I see. Because <laughs> it has to go with the rhythm. Um, so, last question is, it sounds like you're optimistic about our survival as a species, um, even in the face of all these natural disasters and political disasters. Would you say that you're optimistic or pessimistic? Uh, both, I would say. Um, yeah, I, I think we are living in very difficult times, and certainly in terms of global warming, you know, some of the predictions of scientists are quite frightening. Yeah. Um, so it's not, I don't think it's, it's not certain that we will overcome these difficulties. We will take sufficient action, action to make sure that catastrophe doesn't occur. Uh, but at the same time, I am optimistic because I know that there is this process of collective awakening, I would call it, taking place. Then there's definitely a change taking place in the collective human psyche. Definitely, you know, more and more people are opening to, to spiritual, to spirituality. And it's slowly creeping through in many different areas. I think more and more people are having awakening experiences. More and more people are undergoing a permanent transformation following on from psychological turmoil. That, that seems to be happening more and more frequently. And just more and more people are interested in spirituality. More and more people are turning towards spiritual paths and practices because they sense that they want to move towards, they want to open themselves, they want to wake up. 
So there's definitely this process taking place around the world. And, and it, it, even the internet, is, I think it's, you know, it's a good, it's a positive phenomenon because it's interconnecting people more and more. It's creating more, despite all of the negative things that are the part of it too, I think fundamentally it's interconnecting the human race um, more and more intensely. So that, that's a positive thing as well. So there is this process of awakening too, at the same time as this you know, impending disaster. Um, so it's really a question of how quickly we can collectively wake up, you know, and whether we can, you know, save ourselves from catastrophe. I don't know what's going to happen, but, you know, it's going to be interesting. I, I think of Hegel and the dialectic, the thesis, the antithesis, the synthesis. So it's really going to be interesting to see what this synthesis is. Yeah, it's like, yeah, there is this process of polarization. There's, you know, it's like increasing awakening and increasing patriarchy and patriarchy and egotism. So it is almost as if the two polarities are becoming more extreme. And, you know, and hopefully there will be some kind of synthesis. Mm. Um, is there anything that we haven't touched on that should be out and about that that you would like to mention? Um, <laughs> not really. You know, I think we covered everything. Yeah, we talked about my... Um, my, my idea of pan-spiritism. Um, so yeah, I mean, what, one of the things I'm trying to do at the moment is to promote the idea of pan-spiritism in, in philosophy, as a, in science and philosophy. There's this philosophy, you, maybe you've heard about pan-psychism, which is like a philosophical approach. I don't which, know. Uh, no, uh, no pan-psychism is quite a popular idea in philosophy now that um, because you can't explain consciousness in terms of brain activity, there's no way of explaining how consciousness can arrive, arise out of atoms and molecules. So one idea is that consciousness has always been present in molecules and atoms. That's panpsychism, ah. the idea that even the tiniest atoms have got a, a tiny amount of consciousness in them. So consciousness was always in matter, basically. All matter is conscious to some degree. But I'm trying to, I'm trying to promote this idea of panspiritism, which is similar, but it's, my idea is that consciousness is actually not just in matter, it's everywhere in the universe, it's in, it's in all space and conscious, consciousness actually preceded the universe, the universe arose out of consciousness. So that's, that's one of my, um, you know, one of my endeavors at the moment. I, I remember, I think it was Edgar Mitchell, the astronaut, who said, we think of this universe as like a vacuum, but he said it's actually a teeming cauldron of, of energetic activity it's so it's it's full of activity yeah i mean that's what quantum physics shows you know um you know strange i mean i think one of one of the impulses which gives rise to materialism is a desire to understand the world and it is a desire to have control over the world if you understand the world then you have control over it mm -hmm. you think ah i've worked things out this is the way things are now i understand the world and um but actually, there's so much about the world which is mysterious and so much that we don't understand. The world is actually infinitely more, conscious, uh, more complex than we can comprehend. So in reality, you know, our understanding is very limited. And, you know, you, you have to, if you accept that, then it means, um, it means losing control of the world. It means accepting the, the mystery, accepting the strangeness. Well, and accept it, don't understand, you can't understand the world. 95% is dark energy and dark matter that we don't really understand, right? I mean, that's mm. a lot that we don't understand. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I think materialism is rooted in this desire for control over the world, desire to control the world through knowledge. And then that goes back to ego and needing to overcome the attachment of the ego. Yeah, that's right, yeah. I like the phrase, um, I'm not sure where this phrase comes from, but somebody said that to understand is to overstand. You know, you, you understand something, you stand over it in, in a position of power. Mm. So it's great. It's actually very liberating to let go of the desire to control the world and the, the desire to understand the world. It's quite liberating to, to accept that the world is incredibly mysterious and we will never understand it properly. Mm. Um. But I'm going to 